Hi there everyone and welcome back to National 5 Biology. Today we're going to be looking at Unit 3, Life on Earth, and starting off with the first key area, which is ecosystems. So there are six parts to Unit 3, uh, mostly they are environmentally based, therefore Life on Earth, looking at animals, plants, how they all live together. One thing to uh, think about when you're revising this unit is there is a lot of terminology in Unit 3. There's a lot of words and definitions that you really just need to memorize. So I suggest when you're going through this that you're pausing this uh, quite often, taking down a note of what these definitions are and that you're looking back over them over and over again until you're totally comfortable with them. So let's make a start. The first part we're going to be looking at is this term called biodiversity. So biodiversity is the number of different species present in an ecosystem and we can use this to classify how, how species rich an area is. So for example, in this picture here, if there are a lot of different species present, both in terms of plants, animals, fish, whatever it may be, biodiversity is said to be high, and this suggests that the ecosystem is very healthy. However, if we look at this example here, we can see there are very few species present. So if there's only a few species present, biodiversity in this case is low, and it suggests that, that ecosystem, the number of different species is low, the ecosystem is actually in danger. So next group of words we're going to be looking at, and before we can actually investigate what these ecosystems all mean, are what an ecosystem actually is. So an ecosystem is a natural biological unit made up of living and non-living parts. All the living and non-living things that work together make up an ecosystem. And the ecosystem in general is composed of a number of different habitats and communities. So habitats are where an organism lives. Your habitat is where you live. And the community is all the living organisms that live within that habitat. Okay, we're not looking at like a single species, we're looking at all the living things in a habitat are called a community. Next, we're looking at a term called population. If we look at communities, we can also look at populations and this time, that is a group of living organisms of the same species. So that's where population and community are different. Community is all the living things in an area. A population is all the living things of one species. So for example, you could have a herd of sheep or a murder of crows, a show of cod. Here we've got a population of penguins on the bottom left and a population of reindeer on the bottom right. They would all be a population. When we're actually looking at species though, we now need to look at what a species means. So a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed in order to produce fertile offspring. So you've probably heard of species for ages, you're know, all throughout school, but you need to actually know the exact definition of species. So really, this is just a more complicated way of saying that a species can breed, they can reproduce together, and the offspring that they produce can also have offspring. That's what fertile means. Infertile is when you cannot have offspring. And we'll look at some examples here. So, for example, if we had a male human and he was to reproduce with a female human, you would end up still with a human. And that human would be able to reproduce once they get to that age. And that is because they are all part of the same species. We are all homo sapiens. So, the male human is homo sapiens, he's reproducing with a female human, homo sapiens, they produce a homo sapiens. It's fairly straightforward. Another example here would be a male lion. If they were reproduced, to reproduce with a female lioness, they would produce a lion. They're all panthera leo, the offspring, the small lion in this case, the lion cub, when he grew up, he'd be able to reproduce as well and produce more lions. One that people find quite tricky though is if you have a male Labrador and a female Poodle, for example. If they were re to reproduce, you would get a mix between them, okay, so you could get a Labradoodle. Now some people think, oh that would be a different species, but that is not correct. All dogs are still the one species, Canis lupus. So the important thing to remember here is that breeds are not species. They are still dogs and they produce dogs and those dogs can reproduce to reproduce other dogs. Breeds are very different from species. What is different is if you have this example here, you have a male horse and you have a female donkey. So the male horse and the female donkey reproduce, they produce something called a mule. 
Now, this is a different case because the male horse, Equus calibus, is different, a different species from Equus asinus, which is the donkey. So therefore, these two species, they have been able to reproduce, but their offspring is infertile. Therefore, they are different species. That mule exists, it has been reproduced by them, but it will not be able to produce other mules. It is infertile. So there are other cases of this in the wild. So we've got some examples here of different animals, different species that have reproduced to produce a, a hybrid offspring is what we'd refer to them. So all these animals are infertile, but they are the, the product of two species reproducing. So a liger would be a mix between a lion and a tiger. A zonkey is a zebra and a donkey. And a zorse is a zebra and a horse. These are all at true real but they are all infertile because of different species reproducing. Okay, next, in terms of ecosystems, we are going to be looking at yet more terminology, and this time we are looking at something called producers. The main part here is how energy moves within an ecosystem, and a producer is an organism which produces its own food. It does not need to rely on any other organism. So mostly these are all green plants because hopefully you know that green plants can produce food through photosynthesis. They don't eat our plants or other animals, they produce their own food, therefore they are called producers. We are going to be looking at something called food chains later on, and you need to remember that a green plant or a producer will always be at the bottom of a food chain because they do not need anything from anyone else. If you are not a producer though, you must be a consumer. So if you think about when you consume something, you effectively you're, you're eating it, a consumer is an organism that gets its energy by eating other organisms. They cannot produce their own food, they have to eat something else. So basically, if you're not a producer, you are a consumer. And there are three main types of consumer, which are herbivores, carnivores and omnivores. So hopefully you've came across these terms before, but just to make sure you know exactly what they mean, a herbivore is a consumer that gets its energy by feeding exclusively on plants. So we've got some examples here. Anything that is just eating plants, and that's where it gets its energy from, is a herbivore. The opposite of that would be a carnivore, where you have a consumer that gets its energy by feeding on other animals. So they will have a, another animal beneath them in the food chain that they will eat, and that's where they get their energy from. The mix of both of these is an omnivore. An omnivore is a consumer that gets its energy by feeding on plants and animals. It can change between them, it can eat both. Two examples here would be bears and also us. We can eat both and we have the digestive uh, capacity to be able to function on that diet as well. Okay, so let's get to these food chains. So a way of showing feeding relationships through an ecosystem is called a food chain. So food chains will start with producers and then an arrow goes on to a consumer. The first consumer is called the primary consumer. And then another arrow would be put in and this passes on to the second consumer, which we call the secondary consumer. It's all fairly straightforward, but what you must remember is the order of these arrows and what the arrows mean. So the arrow shows the direction of energy flow in an ecosystem. It shows energy is being passed on from the producer to the primary consumer, and the energy is being passed on from the primary consumer to the secondary consumer. It is not the other way around, it's not showing what eats what or what is eaten by what, it is the flow of energy through that ecosystem where that energy gets passed on to. So make sure you have this, highlight it, I don't know what you want to do to memorise it, but it's very important that you remember what these arrows in the food chain actually show. So we'll have an example of a food chain here. If you have some grass, grass is a producer, it produces its own food from energy from sunlight. The energy for that, though, can get passed on to a zebra, for example. The zebra here would be a primary consumer. It eats the plant material. It's a herbivore because it's eating the plant. That's where it's getting its energy from. But then you can also have a secondary consumer, in this case, a lion, which is a carnivore. It is going to eat the zebra. Now, that means the energy that started off from the sun, getting taken in by the plant, then gets passed on to the zebra, and then gets passed on to the line. In a later lesson, we're going to have a, a closer look at how that works. This is a bit of a task for you to do, just to make sure you get this in your head. 
uh, you've got four organisms here and you'd have to sort these into a food chain and remember to use the arrows correctly. So if you want to pause that and do that now, I will move on to the answer on the next slide. Fairly simple, hopefully you should have the idea that the grass would be eaten by the beetle, the beetle would be eaten by the blackbird, and the blackbird could be eaten by the cat. So effectively showing the energy flow from grass to beetle, beetle to blackbird, blackbird to cat. Like I said, the main thing we're looking at here is energy. We're not really looking at what eats what or what direction that would go. It's the energy that's passed from grass to beetle to blackbird to cat. And you should think of that fairly logically. Food chains are fairly simple. And because of that, they are not complex enough to show every feeding interaction in an ecosystem. To do that, we have to take all the different food chains and put them together into something called a food web, which is basically a bunch of food chains all working together. So it'd be looking something like this. So in this example here, if you want to dissect it a bit, you're not just looking at um, the energy flow from carrots to rabbits to foxes. You're looking at all the other different species that interact within that ecosystem and who is eaten by what, what eats everything else. And it can become a lot more complicated. Often you'll be asked what actually happens if you remove one of these species from the food web and what impact that would have. So for example, looking a bit closer at this picture here, if you were to remove carrots, rabbits would not starve out and die because they also eat grasses. If you removed, I'm trying to think of an example, looking at these ones here, if you remove birds, for example, then foxes would probably be eating more rabbits because they were eating rabbits and birds. If there are no birds, then that would be a problem for the rabbit population. Okay, Every interaction has some sort of knock-on effect to the rest of the organisms in that ecosystem. And again, we will be looking at it in a bit more depth. This is another task that would be good for you to do. There are those four organisms we have already looked at, blackbird, grass, beetle, cat. And instead of a food chain, I am wanting a food web. But that would only be one food chain there, so I'm going to add some more. There's also a deer, hawk, and sheep. So if you could try and put that into some sort of food web, we can then discuss that on the next slide, which I'll just turn to now. So what you should get is something looking a bit like this. Grass would be getting eaten, as you said before, by the beetle, and then the blackbird would be eating the beetle, the cat eat the blackbird, but there are different organisms now. So the grass would also be getting eaten by deer and sheep. The blackbird could be getting eaten by the hawk. It could be getting passed on there. So there is starting to show this energy is going in different directions as well. It's becoming a bit more complex than just one food chain. And again, just to make this a bit more complex, this time I'm going to add a wolf into this. So if you move on now to this one here, you should hopefully find out that there is a bit of a difference here in the interactions because the wolf has came in, it's totally changed what's happening in the ecosystem. The deer and the sheep weren't getting bothered by anything, now the wolf can be coming across and eating them. Uh, the cats, for example, that were eating the blackbirds and were quite happy, they could now be getting eaten by the wolves. You could be asked in the exam to either talk about the impact of a new predator being put into this uh, food web or the removal. So it's worth just trying to figure out how these interactions work and what effect they all have. An extra task for you, just to make sure you're totally comfortable with food webs, is this here. This is a bit of a scientific literacy question for you as well. This is an excerpt about a bird called a capercaillie. And what I'd like you to do is create a food web purely from the information given to you there from basically what the capercaillie eats and what eats the capercaillie. So show the energy in that ecosystem that's been described here. So again, I'll move on to the next one. Your food web using that information should look a bit like this. The capercaillie is in the middle there. It eats leaves, Scots pine needles, and blueberries, so that's where it gets its energy from. However, unfortunately for the capercaillie, the capercaillie is also an energy source for foxes and wildcats. So out of that fairly small bit of information, you can make an entire food web already. And that could be quite a good question to, to practice on. Moving on to a new bit of terminology as well. This word here, niche, comes up quite a lot and people sometimes struggle with it. So what a niche is, is the role that an organism plays within its ecosystem and how it interacts. So you need to think about an organism, any organism, and have a think about what resources does it compete for. So what does it need in terms of food, water, sunlight, habitats, this sort of thing. What does it feed on? 
what feeds on it, and how well does it actually survive. Now, this one here doesn't change the light available. I want you to remember as well that when we're looking at organisms, it's not always about animals. Plants can come into this as well. There's a huge amount of competition, massive amount of competition that comes from plants that we'll look at at another point. So a niche is the role that it plays. One thing to look at here is invasive species. Is that the reason why an invasive species, so a species that uh, gets brought into another country or another habitat, it can be really destructive because they can take over another species' needs. Everything's all in balance, everything's working well, but if a new species comes in and takes over, that native species, the original one, could lose out and become extinct. An example of this that we hear about quite a lot are red squirrels because of the invasive grey squirrels, which are bigger, basically bigger, stronger, and they're shoving the red squirrels out. So for example, just in 1998, it's not too long ago, you can see how much more widespread the red squirrel was, and there was only a few parts of grey squirrels up in, for example, Scotland, and if you look across Ireland, by 2010, the grey squirrels are starting to take over more and more, and this is even with the amount of reintroductions and conservation of red squirrels that have been going on. This is all because of niches being impacted. Now, I spoke earlier on about competition, and that is the last thing we're going to look at in this lesson. And like I said, I know there's a lot of words to learn in this, and we're flying through it, so you need to be making sure you're going through, writing down all these terms, and learning them. So when we talk about resources in a niche, or what a species may compete for, resources could be water, they could be food, they could be mates, they could be areas to live in, any of these things at all. If there is not an unlimited supply of them, which there never is, if a resource is limited, it's going to be competed for. And that means different animals, different species sometimes, are going to be competing for the same resources. So there are two different forms of competition. There are interspecific competition, and there is intraspecific competition. So obviously they sound quite similar, so you're going to have to make sure that you're quite comfortable with which one is which. Interspecific is competition between different species, whereas intraspecific is competition within members of the same species. The way I like to remember this with interspecific is inter means between. So if you think of an international flight, that'd be a flight going between different countries. So interspecific is members of different species competing against each other. So for example, in this one here, we have a wolf and a bear fighting over a food resource. That would be interspecific competition. If these two species compete for the same resources over and over again, then eventually, if one species keeps losing out, they could actually die out from an area. So, if we look at intraspecific, this is what I was saying here with the same species, members of the same species need exactly the same resources as each other. They're all the same. They're all very, very similar. And this means that competition is much, much greater within species than between species. So intraspecific competition is actually a, a more intense form of competition than interspecific competition. So individuals within species will compete for food, water, mates, light, territory, a range of things, and they are always going to be competing for each other for these things. For the next couple of slides, I'm just going to give you a couple of pictures. I would like you to look at them and identify if they are an example of intraspecific competition or interspecific competition. So for example here, I'll move on in a little second and let you identify what these are. Okay, so you should hopefully find out in this one that this is intraspecific because it is two wolves, two members of the same species, fighting over things. And here as well, two members of the same species is intraspecific, they're fighting within each other's species. Again, for this one here, you should hopefully notice that in the bottom left, we have two different species competing for each for a resource. So that is interspecific. And on the one on the right, we have a few lions scrapping it out over a female. That would be an example of intraspecific competition, competition within the same species. Okay, thanks folks. That is the end of part one. I've got a couple of past paper questions just after this one if you want to give them a go. But this is a bit of a summary of everything you need to know for ecosystems. As I've said, a huge amount of words, huge amount of terminology and definitions for you to learn, and we've went through this very quickly. Just make sure you're learning these, and they should be fairly easy marks for you in the exam. 
So moving on to these questions here, this is an example I was talking about where they'll give you a food web and you have to select organisms from the food web in order to complete a food chain, starting off with Canadian pondweed. So I'm going to go through the answer now. There are numerous different answers you could have, so just try and follow the one I've got here. You have to add in three more organisms to produce a food chain from the food web. So there's Canadian pondweed has been done for you. Next up is going to be mayfly larvae. You could then move up to uh, water boatman larvae and then to sticklebacks, or you could do water boatman stick and uh, dragonfly larvae, or you could do Canadian pondweed, mayfly larvae, sticklebacks, kingfishers. There's a, a big range of ones here. As long as you're just following those those chain, following those arrows of energy flow through the ecosystem, that should be a simple mark for you. This question here is from a multiple choice question. It's asking you if the number of freshwater shrimps was found to have decreased dramatically, what effect would this have on the number of dragonfly nymphs and microscopic algae? So find out where they are in the food web and have a look at what you think that would do to the population. I'll give you a minute to think of that. Okay, so hopefully in this one you should find out if the number of freshwater shrimps, so on the right hand side, if that population was decreased massively, then that's going to have a, an effect of an increase on the microscopic algae competition because they're not getting eaten by the freshwater shrimp anymore or as many of the freshwater shrimp. So microscopic algae would increase. The next effect though would be that dragonfly nymphs would decrease because the dragonfly nymphs eat the freshwater shrimp and the mayfly nymph. So effectively half of their food sources have gone. They're not going to die out because they still have mayfly nymphs but their population would decrease. And finally, this is a terminology question for you, showing the, the, the real uh, importance of learning all these words so far. You have three statements with a word that is underlined. If you think the statement is true, you just tick true and you get a mark for it, hopefully. If you think the statement is false, you tick false, but you must correct what the underlined word is. You don't need to write out the full uh, sentence again, just correct the underlined word. So using the food web, have a look at the statements and I'll go through them in a minute. Okay, so if you look at the first statement here, the stone loaches are the predators of brown trout. So if you look at where they are in the food web, stone loaches, and there's an arrow pointing from stone loaches to brown trout, which means they are not predators of them, they are prey. They are being eaten by the brown trout. So you would take false for this one and say they're not predators, they are prey. For the next one, there are three producers in this food web. If we look at the producers, there's plan plankton and there is water beet. There is not a third one, so you'd say false, there is only two. And for the last one, the caddisfly larvae are herbivores. So again, if we look at the food web, caddisfly larvae are eating plant plankton, that's where they're getting their energy from. There's no evidence there to suggest anything that they're eating any other any meat or anything other than that. So yes, from this information, the caddisfly larvae are herbivores, so that is true. That's just giving you a bit of a flavour of the questions you get. This part of the, the course isn't the most difficult but there's a lot of information to take on board. So try and work your way through these. Again, any way that you like to revise, whether you've got a mind map, whether you're just writing them out, whether you're doing diagrams, you just need to remember all these words that are being thrown at you. I hope you found this lesson helpful. I'm going to be getting on to the rest of Unit 3. I know a lot of people have got prelims coming up and are wanting Unit 3 covered, so I'm going to try and get through this as quickly as I can. Uh, again, thanks very much for listening, and I hope you're finding these useful.